lose their business people, and they found that it just was not working, and they were plunged into an incredible recession. And since the late 90s, Sweden, Denmark, all those countries have been electing really center-right governments ever since and moving away from it, and they have, their economies have bloomed as a, as a result. So what we really want to, wanted to say in this book is that at least be honest. You know, when Elizabeth Warren talks about having something like a Medicare for All and free college, let's look at how they pay for it in those countries. Because in those countries, what they while they do have incredibly generous, welfareist, if you want to call it, social safety net type policies, who pays for it? It's not the millionaires and billionaires. Everything that you see the left sort of advocating for, wealth taxes, they don't do those in those countries. None of the Scandinavian countries have any wealth taxes anymore. Minimum wage, they don't have minimum wages in those countries. Low corporate taxes, those countries had much lower corporate income tax than the United States until the Trump tax cuts lowered ours to be more similar to theirs. So they have low corporate taxes. All of the things that you know capitalism is promoting, that's kind of what they're doing. So how do they pay for, say, you know, universal health care? Well, for one thing, it's a 25% sales tax on literally everything that their citizens buy, including food. So a gallon of milk, a dozen eggs, a pair of blue jeans, and that's an incredibly you know, regressive tax because obviously the poorer you are, the less money that you have, the more of your income goes to your consumption of your basic needs. And so everything there, I mean, anyone who's traveled to a Scandinavian country knows it's insanely, insanely expensive because of that 25% VAT. And that is applied all the way across the production chain, this 25% VAT tax. On top of that is, you know, their income tax. And it's an income tax that I don't think most people would really accept in this country. I mean, in our country, the top 1% already pays over 50% of our income tax. In, in those countries, if you're making about $60,000 a year, that's when the 60% income tax at 60% and 60000 So, you know, over and over again, people would ask Elizabeth, they're like, you know, will middle class taxes rise? And she'd say, well, your costs will go down. In other words, we're just going to take all your money, and then we're just going to take care of all your basic needs. And so it, it really is, they have a much more uh, regressive tax structure than we do in the United States. Um, yeah, that's another thing that they won't tell you. Also, you know, when it comes to the free education, let's face it, when the state is paying for it, they take a much more control and vested interest in it. So, yeah. so I have a good friend who's a Danish journalist, and she's like, you know, and her kids have gone to school in the United States, she sees both sides, and she's like, it's a totally different system there. You start getting tested early on, and the state decides every year with the university system, how many uh, nurses do we need? How many oh, computer wow. scientists do we need? Oh, nice. And the, those are the majors that you get into. If you don't test into those, they're going to send you to this school or that school. You want to major in something like political science, which is a popular major in the US, uh, they don't need a whole lot of political <laughs> science. <laughs> yeah. So she's like, you know, the major in political science in Denmark, you have to be like smarter than a nuclear. So you, know, you have to be the top 1%. because. So again, I don't think that our young people who are clamoring for Bernie thinking everything's going to be free, they don't realize that the state will control that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I always joke, we all see that clickbait on the internet, the Danes are the happiest people in the world, right? You see those happiest, happiest internets, and they're always like number one or number two, and the U.S. were like down to like number 20 or whatever, and they accompany that with that picture of the Danes on their bikes, and they're thinner than we are, and they're better than that, and they're riding their bikes, and I'm always laughing, I'm so, I've heard of the book, I'm like, why are they on a bike? Because they have a 100% car tax, you can buy <laughs> It actually was 200% until about a year ago, and they elected a bunch of libertarians, and they lowered it to a reasonable 100% tax report. So try to dispel a lot of this, and at least be honest about it. Because you know, I think they're just sort of selling this fairy tale world that the government can provide everything for you, and it doesn't cost anything, or that only this other group, this wealthy group that is somehow cheating their way out of things. And we really try to show that in this country, you know, the, the top 1%, the top 10% are virtually paying most of the income tax in this country. So those are the things that we try to do.
Those are the things that I All right, you're taking my line. All right. <laughs> Pessimistic about like, oh, it's so big, debt's so big, and we borrow. We do have problems. But actually, what amazes me more than our problems is how resilient we are as a country. And as big as a government is, as much as it intervenes in our lives, our personal life, God, we're doing pretty darn well. There's a website that I like that sort of puts in perspective how well we're doing. It's called uh, Human Progress. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Parcato, and it's uh, just amazing. You know, in 1820, when the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is starting, 90% of people live in extreme poverty. It's $2 a day, as measured by the World Bank, constant dollar. 90% of the world lives in extreme poverty. When I was born in the early 1960s, we've gone from 90%, only about a third of the world lives in extreme poverty. Today, less than 10% of the entire world lives. Have you ever seen anything like that? Yeah. is admitting how great a world is. So I've started out in speeches now to young people saying there's never, ever, ever, ever been a better time to be alive. Yeah, that's true. We're all in is this like, oh, woe is me. And it's like, yeah. There's so many things. There's less racism than there's ever been. There's more freedom in your personal lives. There's less discrimination. I'm not saying it's a perfect world, but there's less of all of it than there's ever been. And uh, go out there and grab it. I mean, the, the world is just waiting for us now. And we just have to make sure that we don't let government get in the way of that. But at the same time, I think we should be optimistic. I think if we're left alone, if government leaves us alone, we'll do just fine. And I look forward to that future. His book is really hard hitting, Case Against Socialism. We have a few copies out there. We only have a limited number of copies, so please be respectful. Um, I live in a, a city where 90% of my friends are hardcore, rabid Bernie supporters. <laughs> and you know what's cool? I'm, I'm, I love them. They're my friends. And they believe strongly in compassion. So do I. My only issue, I want them to achieve uh, their cause. My issue is force. Yes. If, if you yes. are bringing force to your cause, then you are the crusader from the 1200s. Yeah. Yes. And, and you're forcing people to go along with your cause. Let me not follow that cause. <laughs> I support your cause. Convince me why I should support that cause. That's all I'm asking for. I'm not asking for anything more. And I think his book gives a great examples of why this, the issue is force, force equality. Uh, you can't have, uh, in, in, we're all different. We have different skills, we have different ambitions, we have different desires. We're not gonna be equal. There's no equal force. An equal force is a hedge. <laughs> Otherwise, you're gonna have different heights. And different. We want that diversity, we want people to grow, we want a really exciting society. And I think this is really important. It's an important lesson for my friends, for my industry. My industry is 90% burning. Uh, because just because Bernie says he's going to uh, legalize cannabis, and I think that's great. But what they don't, what they're getting a real painful lesson in right now is the, the pain of regulations. Mm -hmm. It's making the industry uh, handcuffed and bled, and people can't find a sustainable path forward. Every single regulation is something that you have to deal with in the way of doing what you want to do. And so the more that we add in, the more the more handcuffed we are. Any case. I'm really excited that we had Grand Paul. Grand Paul, thank you so much. The party is not over. Uh, we have an incredible chef today who cooked for our dinner and is providing our appetizers. Where's Devin? Devin! Pasta in a cheese wheel with fire and cognac. <laughs> but it's his birthday today. Oh. Uh. <laughs> so, I'm not going to sing you a song, but I just want to say happy birthday, brother. Thank you right. so much. Happy birthday. And uh, if we have a book or two, grab one, grab a book, not more. Be uh. respectful. We only have a limited number. And thank you guys so much. The party's going to continue. It's 10 30. Please enjoy. All right. Yes, <laughs>
Okay.